So this is a different kind of video from the ones I usually do. It's off the cuff, there's no script. I just ran through it once to make sure I understood the material, make sure it came in under an hour, that kind of thing. Closer to how you prepare for an actual public talk, although for a professional talk I always try to rehearse it a few more times. This is the first video in what may become a series, if all goes well, that I call Exoplanets Review. For those of you who don't know, my name is Alex Howe, and I am a postdoc at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. And my field of study is primarily exoplanets. I was inspired to make this video by Raptor Chatter's monthly Paleontology in Review videos, which you should definitely check out. There's a lot of interesting stuff there. But after I'd watched those for a few months, I thought that's something I could do, except with exoplanets. And as I thought about it, it sounded like a good idea. So I decided I'd try it. It was something I felt qualified to do. There didn't seem to be anyone else doing something like it. You can find plenty of YouTube videos about individual planets or even individual papers, but no real surveys of the field like this. I also thought it would help me commit to making science videos on this channel more regularly. And it also helps me commit to staying on top of the latest research professionally. So it's sort of a win-win. So the way this will work is each month I'll look through all of the exoplanet-related papers posted on archive.org, and I'll pick out the dozen or so that I think are most interesting. Archive.org, and specifically AstroPH, is the main preprint repository for astronomy and astrophysics papers on the internet. Almost all new papers in astronomy and astrophysics have preprints up for free on AstroPH, at least after they're published, and usually after they're accepted or even submitted. I should say now that there's a lot of great research going on in the field, I could have easily picked twice as many papers, but I need to keep this video to a reasonable length. So I only picked what I consider to be the top ones, and if you're interested in exoplanets, I strongly encourage you to look up some of the other new papers for yourself. So without further ado, this is Science Meets Fiction's Exoplanets Review, January of 2022. Now, most of the news stories you'll see in the popular press about exoplanets are about interesting new planet discoveries. Sometimes you'll see other papers about uh, the number of planets that are discovered or characterizing a specific planet, especially if they find water. But most of the ones you see in the popular press are about new planet discoveries. So we'll start with those. And almost certainly the biggest discovery of the past month was the second discovered exomoon, a moon orbiting an exoplanet, Kepler 1708b1. That's uh, Roman numeral 1, which is the uh, standard naming convention for moons. This object was discovered by David Kipping and his team, who have been working on exomoons for many years. They discovered the previous exomoon candidate, Kepler 1625b1, and this new one looks very similar to it. And that is very unusual because we say this a lot in the field of exoplanets, but it's nothing like what we expected. This is a Neptune-sized moon orbiting a Jupiter-sized planet. And that's very strange. We did not expect to see something the size of Neptune caught in the orbit of another planet. The exomoon was discovered by looking carefully at transit light curves. So these are the transit curves that you get when the planet passes in front of its star and blocks some of the light. The amount of starlight received by the telescope dips by a fraction of a percent. And if there's a moon, the moon also blocks a little bit of the light. It's much smaller, and it overlaps the main transit. But it's still a detectable separate component that they can resolve statistically. And this is new territory for exomoon searches. Previous searches looked at close-in planets. This one's quite a bit farther out. Kepler 1708 is an F-type star, a little bit hotter than the Sun, uh, but the planet is on a 737-day orbit, which uh, would give it a temperature similar to Mars. The planet's about Jupiter-sized, the moon is a mini-Neptune, so a little bit smaller than Neptune, but at that size it will still have a thick hydrogen atmosphere. 
and it orbits the large planet in 4.6 days. That's about the same as Europa's period around Jupiter, so that could result in significant tidal heating of the moon like you get on Europa, but we can't be sure of that. Either way, it's a bizarre object, but since it's the second Neptune-sized exomoon detected, it's probably a real class of objects that, like most of what we find out there, we did not expect. So that's an interesting result that bears more theoretical work later. Now, there were many other interesting discoveries of new planets this month, but I think the most interesting were two gas giants orbiting M-dwarfs. M-dwarfs are red dwarf stars that are about half the size of the sun and smaller, kind of like this illustration. And quite a few M-dwarfs have planets, but very few have gas giants. Since they're smaller stars, they also have fewer solids in the protostellar disk to form planets around them. So we mostly see small rocky planets around M-dwarfs. But these are two new Jupiter-sized planets orbiting M-dwarfs. They were discovered by TESS. One's about Saturn size, the other's closer to Jupiter size. And they both have very short periods, so they're hot Jupiters. And they're an M1 and an M2 star. They're not the smallest red dwarfs, but they are still red dwarfs. So that's an interesting find. Now, looking at individual planets is all well and good, but one thing I like to take a look at when there are new results are the population of exoplanets as a whole. And one group that's been getting a lot of great results where that's concerned is the California Kepler survey. They're the ones with B.J. Fulton who discovered the radius gap in the Kepler exoplanets. And here they took a closer look, breaking that population down in different ways. So in the planets discovered by Kepler, and we find it with TESS and other transit surveys as well, there are two populations. A population of smaller super-Earths, which are solid planets like Earth but bigger, and a second population of mini-Neptunes, which are like Neptune with a thick hydrogen atmosphere but a little smaller. And at around two times the diameter of Earth, there's a gap where there are not as many planets. There are still some, but not as many. And you see the standard diagram here, radius versus orbital period. And those are what these transit surveys measure, so that makes sense. But that's not exactly the best breakdown. Because we think the radius gap is caused by evaporation of the atmosphere, which is driven by how much sunlight the planets receive. So in panel B, you see the planets grouped by radius versus bolometric flux, which is the amount of sunlight they get. And there, the radius gap is even clearer. And in panel C, they go by stellar mass, which, interestingly, the gap becomes clearer at high stellar mass. That probably makes sense, because uh, larger stars are hotter and produce more ultraviolet light, which is believed to be what causes the radius gap. And then panel D uh, is by metallicity, which is, the amount of, which is the amount of solids relative to hydrogen and helium. That doesn't seem to have any relation to the radius gap, which is pretty much expected. Now here's a zoomed-in version of the same figure, where they've marked with these lines exactly where the radius gap falls. And what's believed to cause the radius gap is ultraviolet light from the star evaporating the hydrogen-helium atmospheres of the mini-Neptunes. Planets that fall in the radius valley will have a very small atmosphere, uh, only about 0.1% of their mass. And that small atmosphere will evaporate very quickly, which will cause the planet to move down to a lower radius in the super-Earth population. Now, this is the standard model, but it is disputed. Another paper addressing the radius gap this month was this one, Creating the Radius Gap Without Mass Loss, by Lee, Corrales, and Thorngren. And these three say that you don't need mass loss, that planet formation itself can create the radius gap. This is showing mass of gas versus mass of the core, and then a histogram of predicted number of planets of a given radius. And their argument goes like this. Planets form a hydrogen atmosphere by accreting it from the protostellar nebula, but the rate of accretion depends on how efficiently the gas can cool so that it can fall onto the surface. For low-mass planets, the limit of maximum accretion is very small, but exponentially dependent on mass. It's actually dependent on mass divided by the speed of sound squared, but the speed of sound won't vary all that much for similar conditions in the disk. So these small planets just can't accrete any hydrogen to begin with. For intermediate mass planets, the maximum accretion rate is exponentially larger 
but it becomes limited by how efficiently the gas can cool because the thicker atmosphere traps more heat and cools slower. So they do accrete hydrogen, but it's a rather specific amount of a few percent of the planet's mass. And then for more massive cores, larger than 10 Earth masses, the gravity well gets deep enough that it can cause runaway accretion from the disk to produce gas giants. And if you add up all three of those contributions across different orbital periods, you get a histogram like the one on the right, where there is a radius gap at about two Earth radii. Not as deep as the one we see, but it is there. So that's an interesting alternate theory of the origin of this radius gap. There were a lot of interesting new papers about hot Jupiters this month. Hot Jupiters were the first planets found around sun-like stars all the way back in 1995. And once again, they were like nothing we expected. These planets are the size of Jupiter, but they orbit very close to their stars, much closer than Mercury in just a few days. And we now know that about 1% of stars have hot Jupiters. They're not the most common, but there's quite a few around. And one interesting case is one of the hottest hot Jupiters, WASP-12b. WASP-12b orbits its star in only one day. And when a planet orbits that close, tidal forces will cause its orbit to decay, and it'll eventually fall into the star. Now, WASP-12b orbits so close that its orbit should be decaying fast enough for us to detect, and that's what this group did using the latest test data. This is a plot of exactly when the transits of WASP-12b occurred relative to its average orbital period, and that horizontal axis is marked in days. So we have data across almost 5,000 days or 13 years of these transits. And you can see, over time, the transits gradually occur, and that's because the orbital period is getting shorter, and every orbit, that difference starts to add up. And when they crunched the numbers, they found that the orbital period is decreasing by 29.81 milliseconds per year. And with a period of one day, that means WASP-12b's orbit will decay in about 3 million years. Now, that's a really short timescale in cosmic terms, but since we know of a few hundred hot Jupiters now, it's not crazy that we'd find one that's that close to colliding with its star. And this orbital decay rate is measured precisely enough that it probably is that close. But the more interesting papers, I think, are about the formation of hot Jupiters. Like this one, Origins of Hot Jupiters from the Stellar Obliquity Distribution. The interesting thing about hot Jupiters is that a lot of them orbit highly tilted relative to their star's rotation. In our solar system, all of the planets orbit in pretty close to the same plane, which is also pretty close to the sun's rotation. But hot Jupiters frequently orbit at a very different angle to their star's rotation. Now, tidal forces will eventually push a highly tilted orbit into an equatorial one. But that only happens for cooler stars. And that has to do with the radiative versus convective structures of the stars. You can see in this graph, with the gray points, which are standard hot Jupiters, on the left side, with cooler host stars, most of them are down near zero inclination. Not all of them, but most of them. Whereas for hotter stars, they're more scattered all over the place. And that's what we expect. But then we have the purple points, which are eccentric hot Jupiters, or eccentric warm Jupiters. These orbits have not been circularized to normal hot Jupiters. And their inclinations are scattered all over the place, even for cool stars. And with the tidal forces around cool stars, there's no way they could have formed there. So that indicates that they probably migrated there from farther out in the solar system. This is evidence for the eccentric migration model of hot Jupiter formation as opposed to being pushed close to the star by drag from the disk or just forming there. It would appear that eccentric migration, perhaps by being scattered by another planet, is the way they form. But if this model is correct, it also gives us information about when hot Jupiters formed. And there was a paper by a different group, Tidal Erasure of Stellar Obliquities Constrains the Timing of Hot Jupiter Formation, that looked into this. And the argument follows on directly if you put them together. Because, at first it seems like we do expect hot Jupiters to have random inclinations around hot stars, 
in the pre-main sequence stage of a star's life, it is fully convective and will exert strong tidal forces. If these hot Jupiters are in highly tilted orbits, they could not have formed before the pre-main sequence phase ended. And that's relatively late in planetary system formations. So that's an interesting result to test planet formation models. Another thing that this eccentric migration model tells us is it makes a prediction about the architectures of planetary systems. What kinds of planets should appear in hot Jupiter systems? And there's some evidence for this in the planet population. As shown by this paper, the intrinsic multiplicity distribution of exoplanets revealed from the radial velocity method. And in this paper, Wei Zhu did a statistical study of known giant planets using the radial velocity method. Giant in this case meaning Saturn size or larger. And found a significant difference in the population between solar systems with close-in giant planets and solar systems with cold giant planets. Now these are not hot Jupiters, they're warm Jupiters with closer orbits than Earth. But we still see solar systems with a warm Jupiter are much less likely to have a second planet, as shown in the top left panel, where the top right panel says solar systems with a cold Jupiter are more likely to have a second planet, especially a giant planet. And we expect this because with eccentric migration, you're usually going to have planets gravitationally scattering off each other, where a close encounter will throw one planet in close to the star and throw the other far away or even out of the system entirely. So if eccentric migration occurs to move a hot Jupiter that close to its star, there are less likely to be other planets in the system because they may have been ejected. So this isn't exactly the statistical test we need, but it is some evidence to further support the eccentric migration theory. When it comes to characterizing new planets, there was a new paper that analyzed a superpuff planet called HIP41378F. And superpuffs are planets that are much lower density than expected. They're down around maybe Neptune mass, but they're but they can be much larger in diameter than Neptune. HIP41378F is estimated to have a radius nine times as great as Earth, which is about the size of Saturn, but a mass that's only 12 times as great as Earth, which is less than Neptune. And we're not exactly sure what causes them. But they should have a very thick atmosphere, which should be prime territory for transit spectroscopy, taking a spectrum of the starlight passing through the planet's atmosphere to detect the chemical signature of what it's made of. So they did this with the Hubble Space Telescope, and the spectrum is flat. No molecular features, or at least any features that you see are just noise. And this has been true of almost every low-mass planet that we've taken a spectrum of. Uh, because we expect to see water at, the, at this wavelength, the water feature amplitude is sort of the metric we use to say how strong the features are, and most of them are pretty close to zero. Now, there are a number of theories for what causes this, especially in superpuffs, uh, some kind of cloud or high-altitude dust. But another interesting theory is that these superpuffs could actually be planets with rings. And that was something Ono and Fortney studied in a framework for characterizing transmission spectra of exoplanets with circumplanetary rings. They weren't specifically looking at superpuffs, but their analysis would certainly apply. So once again, when a planet passes in front of its star, it blocks some of the starlight. But if it has rings, it'll block more, because the rings, they'll let some light through, but certainly not all of it. And this can make the planet appear larger than it really is, and it can also make the spectrum flatter, because the rings just block out light, they don't have much of a transmission spectrum. So they created model transit spectra of a planet passing in front of a, of a Neptune-sized planet with Saturn-like rings passing in front of its star. And they found that even a small tilt to the rings of 15 degrees can make the spectrum appear a lot flatter. And a 30 degree tilt can make the spectrum appear almost completely flat. And a higher tilt can make the planet uh, appear as large as Saturn, much like HIP41378F, although that requires the rings to be pretty much face on like Uranus, so that would be a very unusual situation. But still, a moderate tilt could explain what's going on with the superpuffs. 
Now, in addition to these, there are also a few more speculative papers. These are still serious theory of exoplanets, but they're a little further afield in terms of what we can actually observe. One of them was H2 dominated atmosphere as an indicator of second generation rocky white dwarf exoplanets. And this paper is talking about exoplanets orbiting white dwarfs. These are rare, but they do exist. We know one for absolute sure, which is uh, white dwarf 1856b, of which this is an artist's illustration. White dwarf 1856b is a super Jupiter planet, about nine times the mass of Jupiter, in a 1.4 day orbit around a white dwarf, which is the end state of a sun-like star after the red giant phase. And it's a star not much larger than Earth. But what we don't know about white dwarf planets is are they the star's original planets that survived the red giant phase? Or did they form from the debris in, of the planetary nebula after the star became a white dwarf, which is what we call a second generation planet? And the argument here is simply that a first generation planet that survived the red giant phase is not going to have a hydrogen atmosphere. Now, a Jupiter sized planet probably will. But a mini Neptune, a Neptune sized planet, will probably lose its hydrogen atmosphere, either to the red giant phase, or if it survives the red giant phase, it can actually be evaporated by the white dwarf. Because a new white dwarf is extremely hot and puts out intense ultraviolet radiation, which can evaporate the atmosphere very quickly. So if we find a small white dwarf planet that does have a hydrogen atmosphere, that is strong evidence that it formed from the planetary nebula as a second generation planet. This paper is blue marble stagnant lid could dynamic, could dynamic topography avert a water world. And this is a paper looking at climate and geography on potentially habitable planets. We found a few of those, but we don't know much about them. And one concern about planets that look potentially habitable is that they could actually be water worlds, which are flooded and completely covered with water. And the issue is, on Earth, we have plate tectonics. The continents move around, they build up large continental land masses that are much higher than the oceanic crust, and this gives us deep ocean basins that can hold a lot of water. But many exoplanets we think may be like Venus. Venus has what's called stagnant lid tectonics, where there are no tectonic plates. Instead, the crust is a single solid piece over the liquid mantle. And without plate tectonics, the concern is that the planet wouldn't build up these high continents that would rise above the water level. But this paper suggests that that's not the case, that there are several ways that stagnant lid tectonics could produce uplifted terrain, not as high as Earth's continents, but still high enough to produce separate continents and ocean basins. And they looked at the plausible limits of these processes to determine how much water a planet with stagnant lid tectonics could have before it's completely flooded. And that's shown by the green lines in this figure for a cold mantle and a hot mantle. This is a plot of water mass fraction versus total mass. Earth falls between the green lines so a planet with as much water as Earth may not be completely flooded, even if it has stagnant lid tectonics. The Trappist-1 planets, however, probably are if they're not many Neptunes with hydrogen atmospheres. Now this paper is not theory so much as it's a mission proposal. It's a very speculative and forward-looking mission, but it's a plausible one. This is the Drake mission, finding the frequency of life in the cosmos. Now, the name Drake is based on the Drake equation, which is an old equation written by astronomer Frank Drake that is what we call a Fermi problem, which is using rough estimates to solve a problem that we can't figure out exactly. The Drake equation estimates the number of advanced civilizations that we can expect to find in our galaxy that we can communicate with, and you just multiply these factors together. Our star is the star formation rate, which is well understood. FP is the fraction of stars that have planets, which is pretty well understood now. It's almost all of them. Eta E, that's, an, that's the Greek letter eta, not an N, is the number of potentially habitable planets per star with planets. And that's how Frank Drake wrote it, but that doesn't make a whole lot of sense today because we know almost all stars have planets. So I would actually change the equation up a bit. You will sometimes see it written in different forms, 
and I think that by swapping two symbols around, it gets clearer. Now, a to p is the number of planets per star, which is greater than 1, and we're getting pretty good at estimating it for close-in planets. It's a little harder for more distant planets. Fe is the fraction of planets that are potentially habitable, which is a few percent, but we're not sure exactly. Fl is the fraction of potentially habitable planets with life, and that's what the Drake mission is all about, because that is something that's just barely possible to figure out with near-future technology. The other factors are ones that we're not going to be able to do in the foreseeable future. The Drake mission stands for Dedicated Research for Advancing Knowledge of Exobiology, and it's a proposed transit spectroscopy survey of potentially habitable planets orbiting M-dwarfs. M-dwarfs because they're smaller, and the planet blocks more of the star's light when it transits, so it's easier to measure its spectrum. And a survey of 50 planets could give a robust order of magnitude estimate on FL. If FL is very low, near zero, the survey could establish an upper limit of around 0.06. If FL is higher, around 0.1, the survey could find it within about a factor of three. Now, there are complications. You need a 20-meter telescope to do it. With a year of dedicated telescope time in space, and you also need 50 known potentially habitable M-dwarf planets to look at, which we don't have yet. And that's probably why the mission's proposed for a 2050 time frame. And finally, we have a paper that went even further afield. Gaia as Solaris, an alternative default evolutionary trajectory. And this title is combining two very different models of planets from very different sources. The Gaia hypothesis comes from James Lovelock in 1972, and simply put, it says that Earth as a whole evolves as a self-regulating system, seeking a physical and chemical equilibrium that is optimal for life. Not seeking in a conscious sense, but seeking as in naturally moving toward it. Meanwhile, Solaris is a science fiction novel by Stanislaw Lem from 1961. You may be familiar with it from the movie adaptation starring George Clooney. And in the novel, Solaris is a planet covered with a single organism, an ocean of organic matter that seems to have an alien intelligence and is able to interact with humans, but its alien nature drives them insane. And this, of course, is a very different idea of a planet evolving as a single self-regulating system. And what this team did was try to combine these models and a few other to define the space of possible Gaia-like systems that could potentially arise on different exoplanets. And they came up with this range of parameter space. And I actually don't know what a lot of that stuff means. I think this is going to need its own video because I feel like this is going to get more into world building. And while it's a serious scientific theory, it seems more interesting to me from a science fiction perspective. So we'll come back to that one another time. So this concludes the Exoplanets review for January of 2022. I'm going to try to make this a monthly video series. We'll see if it works out. But with luck, we'll be back next month with a new video showing all the interesting new research that comes out in February.